Welcome to the Equipping You in Grace podcast, hosted by Dave Jenkins. The Equipping You in Grace podcast is a podcast about helping Christians develop a biblical worldview in a conversational tone about issues inside and outside the church. Now, for today's episode, let's join our host, Dave Jenkins. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Equip You Grace podcast. My name is Dave, and I'm the host for this show. And on today's episode, we're going to continue our series on suffering, talking about finding joy in suffering. Now, Christian joy does not deny the reality of pain or suffering or grief. You know, such circumstances can actually produce joy in that through them, we might walk more closely in communion with the Lord. In fact, in James 1, 2, we're called to count it all joy in all circumstances and situations, in all trials for that matter. Now, James is not teaching us that suffering is good in and of itself. We are not to say that our pain by itself, it makes us more joyful. We're to count or even to regard it as joy when we encounter various trials. And we do this because trials, they give us the opportunity to endure and be made more mature and complete, according to James 1, 3 through 4. By itself, a hardship is not a good thing. But you see, since God will use it to make us more holy, we and I, we can rejoice in the sanctifying work that he accomplishes through times of personal pain. Knowing that our Father is working everything together for good in my life, in your life, according to Romans 8, 28, means that you and I, we can face trials with courage. We can even look for opportunities to grow in the Lord during such times. In fact, sometimes we grow more holy only when trouble comes into our lives. This notion is foreign to most people because of the widespread belief that God owes us a life free of emotional and physical pain. And yet the Lord never promises us our best life now or an easy life at that, though he does promise to be with us in our difficulties and to lead us through the valley of the shadow of death, according to Psalm 23, verse 4. Therefore, we rejoice in his presence to guide us, to purify us. Now, it's easier to say we must count our suffering as joy. It's much harder actually to do such a thing, right? Remembering, though, that the Christian life anticipates the future will help us to find joy in the midst of hard things in our life. Now, we need to remember God does not promise us a life free of trouble, but he does say our difficulties are limited by time. Pain will not last forever. There will be one day a new heavens and a new earth, according to Revelation 21. The life of joy is not one in which we can simply believe in God. It is one in which we believe God will one day right all wrongs. Now, Habakkuk 3, 17 through 19, it looks to the Lord to make us as sure-footed as the deer who traverses high and dangerous mountain paths with ease, trusting the Lord to impart strength and confidence to us, even in the midst of hunger and poverty, it's going to bring us joy. So that means our future hope in the Lord, rightly understood, does not make us callous to the needs and the importance of this present life. In fact, it makes us alive today with confidence, sure of the Lord's presence as we cur- courageously face the unknown. Second Corinthians 4.17 says this, This slight momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. So if you find it hard to be joyful today, consider whether you are too attached to this life and not enough to the life to come. So the first century church in Thessalonica stands out as one of the healthiest churches in the New Testament. As evidence, we only need to look to 1 Thessalonians 1, 6-7, wherein Paul says that Thessalonian Christians were an example to all believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. Now, the Roman province of Macedonia and Achaia, it covered territory that makes up most of modern Greece. Paul does not describe any of the other churches he addresses in his epistles as examples or models for others. And so the Thessalonians evidence Christian virtues in a special way. Now, we must ask the question, why was the church at Thessalonica an example to others? Well, first, that church was located in one of the most important cities of the Roman Empire. 
the pro the capital i mean of macedonia thessalonica it lay near the conjunction of several imperial crossroads it was an important seaport so news of how the christians there lived naturally spread to churches in other parts of the empire other believers could not miss uh, the example that the Thessalonians would set. Second, and even more importantly, the Thessalonian church was a positive example. And this is because the Christians in Thessalonica imitated the apostles and the Lord Jesus by receiving the word of much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, according to 1 Thessalonians 1 6. Now, Acts 17 1 through 9 reports the fierce opposition that the gospel endured in Thessalonica, and Paul references it elsewhere in the Thessalonian correspondence as well in 1 Thessalonians 2 14 through 16. Still, the Thessalonians believed the apostolic message even though they knew it would bring suffering, and they continued to suffer for the kingdom of God well after their conversion, according to 2 Thessalonians 1.5. The Thessalonians, knowing that living as Christians would mean their suffering, just as it meant suffering for Jesus and his apostles. It did not turn them away from the faith preached to them. Now, the Thessalonians were examples not merely because they suffered, but because they suffered with the joy of the Holy Spirit, according to 1 Thessalonians 1 6. They did not reject the vocation of suffering for the sake of the kingdom of God, to which all believers are called to today. Rather, they rejoiced that they could suffer for the sake of the Lord, as we see in Matthew 16 24 and Acts 5 41. They were not sadists who enjoyed suffering for suffering's sake. Instead, they had the spirit wrought joy in suffering that makes believers willing to endure the harshest opposition if that is what it means to be faithful to the Savior and Lord, King Jesus Christ. Disciples are not above their masters, so we cannot think that we are above suffering for the sake of the kingdom of God. After all, Jesus and his apostles suffered, and we must be willing to do the same. That means as we trust the Lord, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we will even find ourselves rejoicing in our sufferings for the gospel, as the Holy Spirit works joy and endurance in the hearts of his people to make them persevere through the pain, looking to the coming glory. Now, we need to understand that joy does not arise naturally from us as we suffer the effects of the fall in this life. Why would James exhort the readers of his epistle in James 1-2 to count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds? His words seemed to be jarring initially, especially at the beginning of a letter to exiles who have been dispersed from their homes. We would expect words that seem to be more sympathetic, perhaps intermingled with pity and compassion. And the, but the brother of our Lord, however, gets straight to the point, and he exhorts the opposite expression of natural emotion, joy amid trial. These seemingly cold words of James are actually filled with warm gospel truth and hope as they point the troubled soul to the root from which the true healing balm comes. You see, our hearts often pleaded for God to remove our burdens as if it felt all-consuming and far too weighty to bear. And yet, in those moments, we found deeper appreciation for the sufferings of our Lord. Jesus needed to withdraw to a solitary place in the Garden of Gethsemane and pleaded in sorrowful anguish to have his cup removed. Yet, he surrendered to the will of the Father there. In fact, as he hung on the cross with his earthly life excruciatingly draining away, he recognized and even delighted in a work greater than the pain. The salvation of the world was taking place through the anguish of his soul. Redemption through his suffering and his shedding of blood. And so if God used the worst suffering for the greatest good, then surely he can and does use our suffering for good as a part of his greater redemptive work. And so the gospel story demonstrates that all suffering comes from the hands of a loving father who has redeemed his own and cares enough uh, to never waste a trial without its having its perfect work. And so as we wade into deep uh, troubling waters in our lives, these trials, they begin exposing our fears, our frailties, our lack of childlike trust in the Lord. And yet all the while they still strengthen our feeble frame and develop aspects of our faith that would have never been exhibited otherwise. 
And so what we're talking about here is that the trials of the Lord's sins are not consuming, but are rather refining and even producing needed and necessary results. As the old hymn says, the flame shall not hurt thee. I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. Only the God of the gospel can do such a work as this. Now, joy is cultivated in our hearts and in our minds when we trust that the Lord is doing this refining work in us as we are experiencing our earthly trials, making complete that which would otherwise be incomplete. This is what James states that this end goal is when he says that trials happen that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing in James 1.4. That perfection comes of being made like the perfect one, the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ's likeness is taking place through our affliction and through our suffering. Now, trials are not evidence that the Lord has forgotten or forsaken us. We need to say that today. Rather, trials are sure proof that the Lord is performing his redemptive work in us. Like a master weaver, God uses the seemingly dark threads of trials to accentuate parts of his masterpiece that would otherwise be inadequate without these threads. Joy comes in knowing that the God-ordained process of being made more complete is presently at work and will not cease until the day we're made like his son. So as painful as that process is, and even will be, what a joy it is to be shaped by and molded to better reflect the one that we love. So sovereignly sent and used by the Almighty, trials ought to be seen as badges of honor in the life of the Christian, a worthiness that is given to those who suffer well in the Lord. You see, Job's trials came because he was upright and highly regarded in the Lord, according to Job 1.8. James likewise says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, in James 1.12. Much like a military uniform would display decorated service through many conflicts, so too a battle-tested soldier of Christ is distinguished by their trials, though not Uh, Though our trials don't merit in themselves anything, trials do bring us a great reward because through our trials we share mysteriously in the suffering of Christ, according to 1 Peter 4, 12-13. Our suffering does not add to the work of Christ, for his suffering is truly sufficient to save. And yet, suffering rendered unto Christ is painful. Yet, still, it culminates in glory and eternal joy, a joy that commences here below as we walk the path of trials. Now, James Stark, opening to his epistle, it's a reality, rattling truth that is needed to wake the troubled mind and soul from the difficult circumstances to deeper and often unseen work that the Lord is doing in our lives. Does that mean that we will always be able to discover the redemptive nature of chronic illness, a cancer diagnosis, or the tragic death of a loved one? Certainly not on this side of glory. And yet we can be confident that he who began a good work in us will bring it to completion in the day of Christ Jesus, and that no tear or sorrow will ever be wasted in the greater plan of our sovereign Lord. So, apart from the grace of God, the outward circumstances of our situations would have led only to self-pity and doubt. But the anchor of Scripture and God's redemptive work in Christ Jesus, they have led us to discover the Lord in a much deeper way, a joy that is known by His children alone. Take cheer dear troubled christian the lord's work is not done the same lord that used the cross for redemption of the world is at work in your trials for his great purposes in this we can have joy we need to remember this because it's so easy and we all know this to be true if you've been a christian for even just a nanosecond you know that it's so easy just to focus on your circumstances on your trials on your hardship Uh, If you can't relate to that, you know what? The the truth is you're going to face trials. You're going to face suffering. Every single one of us, this side of heaven, is going to face times that test the best of us. Uh, Jesus said this in John 16, 33, in this world, you're going to have tribulation. Uh, You're going to have financial issues. You might even have emotional problems, maybe health problems, mental problems. Or you're going to have family strife or some conflict maybe in your local church. Uh, but but the the reality is is we live in a Genesis three world. We live in a Romans one world where people are naturally lovers of self instead of lovers of God. 
In fact, in this in these last days, Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3 that, that people will be lovers of self. In fact, they will find themselves and be attracted to people who, who tickle their ears. Uh, that's why we need the truth of Scripture. And that's why we need to remind ourselves and be instructed by the truth of God's Word alone. We need to be discerning in this, to be sure, as the Brians were in Acts 17.11. We need to test all things and hold fast to with that which is good, as 1 Thessalonians 5.21 says, so that we're not deceived by the wiles of, of Satan who prowls around like a lion, as Peter says in 1 Peter 5. But, but make no mistake, we ourselves need to be reminded daily. We need to be in the Word of God. We need to be reading and studying and meditating on the Word of God, taking it in, memorizing it, thinking about, uh, as Philippians 4, to think on these things. And the things that he talks about are those things that are noble and pure and good and lovely. We need to be reminding ourselves of the, of the benefits that are ours because we are the Lord's and He is ours and, and we need to preach this to our soul. We need to keep preaching it to ourselves, looking to the author and the finisher of our faith, the one who bled and died and rose in our place and for our sin. Uh, the, the, the matter is not if suffering is going to come. The matter is, are you prepared for the suffering that you're going to face? Now, in this series, we're going to talk a lot about uh, suffering. That's the, that's the theme that we're covering. But, but if you look... You look at our Lord, he suffered. He suffered a tremendous amount. You look at all the New Testament letters, they're almost always written to suffering Christian in some way. Uh, the James, the, the letter that we that we worked through today a little bit, uh, Hebrews is written to struggling Christians. First Peter is written to believers that are suffering. And that's just that's just three examples. We could go on and on. Um, but the point is this God cares. The point is this. God cares that we prepare for suffering, and he cares how we're going to grow through suffering. Because as we talked about previously, the Lord is unchanging. He is with us, and he's there for us. He, in every way, is present. He, he is present there with us in the midst of our hardship. His promises remain the same as 2 Corinthians 1.20. In fact, Jesus tells us in the Upper Room Discourse in John 15 and 16 that Jesus sends the Holy Spirit to help us, to teach us, to comfort us. And what does the comforter do? He walks alongside of us. So in every way, God has provided for us. And here's another thing that we're going to talk about as well in this series, is that Jesus is our high priest. He ever lives to make intercession for us. That means that not only has he given us the spirit, not only has he given us his unchanging word, which he never lies, and his promises are sure and steady and reliable and trustworthy and binding on our lives and point us to Christ alone, but every way from considering uh, the Holy Spirit as our comforter, Jesus as our high priest, and the grace of God that Jesus has provided to us in his finished and sufficient work, the Lord is provided all of these means so that we can prepare for and that we can face our suffering. So please know that I'm, uh, as you prepare for and as you're facing suffering, please know that the Lord is with you. His promises remain the same, and he is faithful and just and true. So I, I want to thank you for listening or watching today's episode of Equipping You Grace. Until next time, may God bless you and keep you. Thank you for listening to the Equipping You and Grace podcast. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe, rate us on the app, and share this with your friends and family on social media. If you want to find us on social media, you can find us on Twitter at Servants of Grace, on Instagram at Servants of Grace, or by searching at Servants of Grace on Facebook. You can also find this episode and many others like it on the front page of our website, servantsofgrace.org.